Hello Book 2. You all no doubt been glued to the wireless, keeping nervous track of the OGBG Book Hall Wars, the, which started out as a local aggression between members of the old geezers book group, but has since spilled over the boundaries of all known decency and enveloped huge sections of our once peaceful and sleepy little hamlet in this corner of Booktube. Aggression has reared its ugly head on a number of different channels, requiring responses from the innocent. <laughs> and the latest two pieces of aggression happened yesterday. Todd Oval at Todd's Bursting Bookcase made a video in which he opens by saying that he was just got back from church work. Mm -hmm. A communion wafer wouldn't melt in his mouth. You wouldn't, you wouldn't fault someone who just got back from church work, would you? And then he launched his howitzers. <laughs> no one was fooled. <laughs> Not at all. And, of course, the OGBG Hall Wars would scarcely be mentionable nowadays without mentioning Mark Richardson who went out and about and came back with a bunch of books that he hauled yesterday. Faced with these dual acts of aggression, there was very little I could do, except to uh, go up the street to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston when my morning's appointment was over, and refuel, restock, give my soldiers more marching orders. So I did that, and I've got a bunch of books to show you, and the first book is a necessary admonishment for uh, the Vermont contingent, it's necessary in the midst of this OGBG book hall warfare, it's necessary, as I've mentioned before, every once in a while, to specifically chastise a participant, to let them know that the eyes of the enemy are upon them, and that they can't steal a march. I had to do that this time around, and so uh, the first thing that I present you with is Dr. Zhivago in this Pantheon edition. <laughs> This is the Max Hayward translation, the first English language translation. There's been another by Peviar and Volkonsky. Uh, and naturally, with dueling translations, they have their strengths and weaknesses. Those of you who know Peviar and Volkonsky are the dream team, the cele celebrity team of Russian translators. And those of you who know their translations, I have quite a few of them in this room, will already know what to expect from them. They do a, largely a superb job, but also at times a very idiosyncratic one. They they try very much to hew their translations to sounding like echoes of the original, even when that's not really all that possible. And, as I'm thinking specifically here of their translation of War and Peace, even when doing that will make a reading experience that is a little bit uncomfortable or even off-putting to the English language monoglot reader. They do that anyway. They make that decision anyway, and they trust to the fact that they have a brand and that they can load it with footnotes so that they trust to that to keep things going. And as a translator's philosophy, I don't object to that. You can give that a try, absolutely. Uh, this translation, which is by Max Hayward and Manya Harari, uh, tries something different, the, tries the other thing in typically typically tried in translations from the Russian, which we saw, we see in uh, great old translations of Tolstoy or Dostoevsky by people like Constance Garnett or the Mods. And that is not to convey in English something of the reading experience in the Russian, but rather to change the Russian into an English reading experience. Uh, those of you who have read, for instance, uh, Rosemary Edmund or Constance Garnett on, uh, translating a Tolstoy story will know exactly what I mean. They are, their translating ethos is not here is the best, the most, clo the closest approximation we can make of the original, but rather, here's the closest approximation we can make of the original into a book as if it were written by a native English speaker. And, you know, both of those schools have their proponents. The, the, uh, the Peviar and Volkonsky school of accentuating the strangeness, the untranslatability of the target book, is temporarily in the ascendance, but they both have their adherents, and who knows how many, hundreds of thousands of people were, were introduced to the great classics of Russian literature or French literature or Spanish literature through things like Penguin or the Modern Library that specifically went for that ethos of we want to make this recognizable and understandable to you. It can work either way. 
I think, and I am, admit a little bit more of a fan of the Englishizing, but merely because, not so much with Russian, but with other languages, I'm very well aware of the fact that there's no way to do it. There's no way to do what Pevyar and Rolkonsky want to do. All you're going to create is some weird kind of centaur, uh, I think, although it can still make for interesting reading. Uh, I don't, at the moment, have the Pevyar and Volkonsky translation of Dr. Chirago, and I must stress that is not an invitation for any of you to find a copy and mail it to me. That is not an invitation to do that. Do not send me a book. <laughs> but I don't currently have that, so I don't have a way to compare the two. But I remember really liking this when this when this first came out. Uh, and there is our our author on the back. A stately fellow who had to go through quite a bit of uh, turmoil to get this book into readers' hands. You would never know it, I think, from that photo, but when he was young, he was a genuine super hottie. <laughs> uh, and you might have seen this edition uh, hauled by the aggressor, Mark Richardson, just yesterday. And uh, I uh, got it not only to be, uh, you know, competitive, <laughs> but also uh, because as soon as I saw it, I laughed, first of all, when I saw it at the Brattle. Uh, this morning, I laughed because there it is. You know, <laughs> it's, if anything's going to keep these hall wars going, it's going to be a getting a Vermonter to start feeling competitive. But one way or another, I saw and thought, what are the chances that this is right here for Dirt Cheap when you just saw it on Mark's channel? But then a second later, I realized the thoughts came on me quickly in a cascade. Sorry about the construction noise. Uh, the crew is teaching newcomers. It's a new year. A lot of their children are now old enough to take over work on this six foot by three foot patch of concrete. Uh, and some of the, the guys who are working on that six foot by three foot patch of concrete, ripping it up with jackhammers, staring at it for a whole day at $35 an hour, then filling it in or and or putting a massive iron plate over it, uh, that they lay unevenly so that every car and truck that touches it makes a sound like an atomic bomb going off. Some of the guys that have been doing that for the last 35 years, just reopening that ground and staring at it, all day and then closing it again. Some of them are getting close to retirement. They're getting they're getting close to retiring, and and it, uh, their kids who were born while they were on the site. I, I congratulated each one of them as the as the babies were born. They have gone to grammar school and then to high school, and now they're ready to take over, tearing up that three foot by six foot patch of concrete directly outside my front door. So that's the the noise that you're going to hear in the background. Uh, but uh, the thoughts when I saw this came on me in a cascade. First, I laughed because it looks like provocation. Even to me, it looks like provocation. I just saw this on Mark's channel. Then I thought, the next thought I had was, yeah, but you're not going to buy a book just because you saw it on somebody else's book channel. And then the third thought was, wait, you don't have a copy of Dr. Zhivago at all. Now, the, the copy of this that I really want is this translation, but it's in a an old-style, white-covered, mass-market paperback. I had that once upon a time, that paperback. It was beautiful lovely thing. I don't have it anymore. Somewhere or other, in some move or other, it got lost. I I loved it, and I, for purely sentimental reasons, I believe it was this translation, but, but totally different cover artwork, and for purely sentimental reasons, I would take that mass market paper bag if I could ever find it again. But I don't think I ever will, because uh, mass markets themselves aren't made anymore, and so they're going to get rarer and rarer. Uh, mass markets for, you know, literature or general consumption. There hasn't been a mass market of Dr. Zhivago in since that mass market was made, and there never will be one again. Which means if I'm, that the, the number of those that are getting out into the population are smaller and smaller, so I probably never see that mass market again. Now at least I have the book for rereading, and the key is you do reread it, because it is uh, a Russian classic. It is absolutely a modern Russian classic along the same lines as Life and Fate or Quiet Flows the Dawn. These things belong on the same shelf as Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and, and uh, Turgenev and whatnot. It's, there's something in the water over there. <laughs> anyway, uh, this next one is a duplicate. Uh, it was in rough shape, so I reinforced it, but I couldn't leave it uh, because I like to give these things away. This particular thing I like to give away, and I don't know who would want it now that I've, re that I've revived it, but one way or another, I wanted it as a double anyway. This is Everybody's Peeps uh, with illustrations by Ernest Shepard. Uh, he, he, Ernest Shepard, a lot of you will know him as the illustrator of Winnie the Pooh, but he does illustrations all throughout here, and they are lovely, absolutely wonderful, and funny. Uh, there's a uh, there's a, a touching one. Uh, 
at the end, yeah, there's Peeps stopping. Stopping his diary. See the pen on the floor? He's covering his face uh, because he's sad. He says at the end of this, he, he worries that his eyesight is gone. And then he has to stop keeping his journal late at night by candlelight. And he says in that final entry that it feels like he's seeing himself go down into the grave. And it, it turned out his eyesight recovered, and he, he, he kept writing here and there, but he never continued with this kind of personal journal ever again. Uh, and the, the I love this edition. The whole point of this edition is that, it, the, the thing that's referenced in the title, is that at the time, abridgments and annotated editions of classical works like Pepys or uh, Gibbon or whatever would come to market, and it, they would become colloquially known by the editor. So it would be, oh, do you have, do you have Lathrop's Milton? Or something like that. And the, the, uh, the editor here, uh, O.F. Morshead, uh, thought about that and said, and instead of calling it Morshead Peeps, he, he called it Everybody's Peeps. Because it's an abridgment, it's a very good abridgment. It, abridging Peeps is an art form on its own. It's a cottage industry on its own. It's a very good abridgment. It does not, despite the fact that this came out at, uh, what, the 1940s? When did Everybody's Peeps come out? I should probably know that. Uh, oh, 1926. Despite that fact, when it came out in, in you know 1926, you would think that since it came out at that period, it would mostly stress Peeps' silly amorous adventures, all the ladies that he falls in and out of love with, all the serving maidens that he uh, stoops <laughs> at one point or another. And, and that isn't true. This editor re resists that temptation and instead gives a very rounded picture of Peeps' life and time. That makes it a very good abridgment, and the illustrations just seal the deal. And I have one of these here in this room, but I, I saw this. It, it was reclaimable. Sometimes I see this and the dust jacket is gone, or the dust jacket is in terrible shape. Uh, so I figured I would at least grab it. Uh, then we have this thing. I've had this before a few times. I think I might have to reinforce this one. This is Philip Rauh, uh, and this is Essays on Literature and Politics, 1932 to 1972. Uh, and this has, it, this is mostly, uh, there is our author, uh, and the thing that killed him. So, uh, why this is the photo, I have no idea. I never understand that. Why that is the photo. I don't understand that. If an author died in a gruesome car crash, and he was beloved, would you hunt around and make sure that the black and white author photo on the back of the book was a picture of him and a split screen with a picture of that make and model of car? No, you wouldn't. In any other circumstances, it would be viewed as the horrible, morbid in-joke that it is. But for some reason, it just... Well, not for some reason. The reason is known. Because Big Tobacco pours billions of dollars a year into characterizing their drug addiction as something cool. Something that betokens rebellion and deep thought. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he's a great writer. A fantastic writer. A cantankerous writer, but a great writer. Wrote forever and ever for the new criterion. And this has, in addition to everything else, it has a forward by uh, Mary McCarthy. And I want to read you just a bit of that. Uh, just the way it begins. It goes on. It's just wonderful. But this conveys quite a bit. So he's gone. That dear phenomenon. If no two people are alike, he was less like anybody else than anybody. A powerful intellect, a massive, overpowering personality, and yet shy, curious, susceptible, confiding. All his life he was sternly faithful to Marxism, for him both a tool of analysis and a wondrous cosmogony. But he loved Henry James, and every kind of rich, shimmery, soft texture in literature, and in the stuff of experience. He was a resolute modernist, which made him in these recent days old-fashioned. It was as though he came into being with the steam engine. For him, literature began with Dostoevsky and stopped with Joyce, Proust, and Eliot. Politics began with Marx and, Engels and Marx and Engels and stopped with Lenin. He was not interested in Shakespeare, the classics, Greek city-states, and he despised most contemporary writing and contemporary political groups, being grumblingly out of sorts with fashion except where he felt it belonged, on the backs of good-looking women and girls. Uh, I've read this volume. A few times I've had this on and off. This will go on this bookcase right here because most of this is concerned with books. There's one section that's concerned with politics. It'll be a joy to read the, that section again as well, but it'll be mainly for for the books that I, that I will read. Uh, 
And then we have another one. This is uh, Jonathan Rabin. This is uh, for love and money. Uh, that somebody took the bother to to uh, dust jacket. And this is a book of his that I have uh, haven't read in ages. I've read all of his more popular books, but this is a kind of uh, collection of autobiogra autobiographical sketches about his life and writing, about his writing life, about how he entered the writing life and what he thinks about all the aspects of it. There's hardly a kind of writing that this guy hasn't done. And I am thinking very strongly about that kind of autobiographical writing in 2021. Uh, and I want to I want to uh, read you just a bit of this as well, just to give you a, a taste uh, for what he's like. Uh, I want to read you the beginning, and then I want to read you his description of book reviewing, which I just love. Uh, this is partly a collection, partly a case history. I've clocked up nearly 20 years as a professional writer, and in that time I've made the intimate acquaintance of all of Cyril Connolly's Enemies of Promise, with the sole exception of The Pram in the Hall. That's a reference to a Cyril Connolly book, don't worry about it. Uh, I've written out of compulsion, for love, and I've needed the money. It is a curious occupation, this business of short-distance commuting between the bedroom and the study, and a subject in its own right. It puzzles people. Strangers at parties striking up a quote-unquote literary conversation don't usually want to haggle over the contents of your review of Martin Amos in last week's Observer, let alone whether your most recent book got off to a bad start or in the first chapter. They have quite probably read neither, but they're still interested. They want to know whether you use a pen or a typewriter, what time you get up in the morning, whether you keep regular working hours, whether you can really make a living from it, and the big clincher, exactly what and how much you get paid. Average adjusters, lecturers in economics, shoe salesmen, property developers, don't wince, shuffle, or gaze distractedly at the ceiling when somebody politely asks, and what do you do? <laughs> For the professional writer, that question, which is quickly followed by, oh, should I know your name? <laughs> is the prelude to a searching catechism of a kind most appropriate to a VAT inspector than to a fellow guest in a drawing room. The safest response to it, if you can summon the requisite bottle, is to say, I'm a steeplejack and beam ferociously. <laughs> That's just the beginning. That's the opening paragraph to give you an idea of what this book is like. But I want to read you also his, uh, he writes a little about uh, how great a book writer, a uh, book review writer V.S. Pritchett was. And then he goes on to talk about book reviewing in just a way. I won't, I won't try your patience any longer than this. Uh, a reviewing job carries with it a license to read more freely and widely than any academic who set books crop up year after year on the same courses and for whom keeping up with one's field tends to mean reading the same words or minor variations of them a hundred or a thousand times over. I once knew a man who staked an entire academic career on his reading of two novels, The Golden Bowl and Giles Goat Boy. Scavenging freelancers, sorting through piles and shelves in the office, a more productive arrangement than the one in which the literator commissions a review of a particular book over the phone. Yeah, it's, that was always the way to go, is if you could, if you had entree at all, go into the office and look at the piles of, of advanced copies, of review copies, so that you can make pitches right there on the spot. That was always the golden ticket. Not possible anymore. All the newsrooms are closed. But once upon a time, if there was any way to do that without having the, the security guard show you out, <laughs> that was the way to do it. Uh, can go off on sprees. The, the freelancer can go off on sprees, immersing themselves in Trollope one month, Ted Hughes the next, the architecture of the city the month after that, Philip Roth the month after that. The literary framework in which they live is necessarily provisional and in a state of continuous expansion and alteration. No depth to it, says the academic, yet the reviewer, working like a bowerbird to spin a web of connections between the different bits and pieces of his reading, is in a position to gain a sense of the broad proportions of things that few academics can rival. So long as he's not exclusively confined to sampling last week's second best novel, but can start off volumes of letters, diaries, biographies, books of criticism, he's being maintained in full-time education, a perpetual graduate student, a happy fate. He is as much a writer as a reader. After the chimes, the amiable Dr. Jekyll emerges as the malevolent Mr. Hyde. For a review, though it must of course be a report and an appraisal, is also a literary entertainment in its own right. And its first duty is to be, quote, a good piece, which, from the point of view of the author of the book, is quite often synonymous with a bad review. <laughs> W.H. Auden once wrote that every reviewer ought to sometimes be able to confess that, quote, this book is more important than anything I can say about it. Auden would have said something like that. Uh, but it's not as easy as that. Most books, even rather bad ones, are more important than what their reviewers can say of them. 
Their sheer length and longevity compared with the sparrow flight of a review across the single page of a newspaper guarantees them their preeminence, and Auden's remark sounds useful sounds a useful warning note about the chronic vanity of book reviewers in general. Yet it's a lousy prescription for actually writing a review. It has the authentic, the authentic alloy ring of a puff written by someone commending a friend's book that he hasn't yet had time to read. The reviewer is there to write, not to melt away from the book in tongue-tied wonder. Gotta love that. I could have that carved on my gravestone if I ever planned on dying. <laughs> Let's read it again. The reviewer is there to write, not to melt away from a book in tongue-tied wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is uh, for love and money. This is Jonathan Rabin writing about his, his basically his education as a writer, he, doing all kinds of things, meeting all kinds of people, having lunch with mom and whatnot. Wonderful. Uh, then this next one, uh, uh, like like some of these, this took a little bit of doing to uh, revive. Otherwise, it would have fallen apart before I could put it on camera. But I have always wanted a hardcover of this. I had a paperback forever and ever, but the paperback didn't have the illustrations. Uh, this is uh, my uh, my wilderness of uh, one volume of two. The, the set was called My Wilderness. This is East to Katahdin by William Douglas, and the illustrations are by Francis Lee Jacks. Let me get you. Uh, there are spot illustrations, and if I remember correctly, there are also full page illustrations. Yes, look at that. Look at how lovely that is. Uh, and this is a piece of uh, a surprising amount of nature writing that was done by William Douglas, who was a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, yeah, here he is in his court robes. <laughs> he was the subject of a great biography called Wild Bill. Amazingly good, in which the biographer, is it Bruce Porter? I forget, who, I forget off the top of my head who the, uh, the writer of Wild Bill, Wild Bill was one of his nicknames on the bench. Uh, and I love that biography. I, I hauled it on this channel. I'm pretty sure I've shown it to you already. It's out in the other room, I think. I think. Books have moved around quite a bit. It might be gone. Uh, but... The, the author of that biography, refreshingly, uh, starts from just the open admission that, that uh, Bill Douglas barely opened his mouth without telling a lie. Told lies even when he didn't need to. Told lies that were easily disprovable on a whole bunch of different subjects. Uh, I myself don't think that disqualifies him from being the subject for a biography or being a subject of historical interest or from being a terrific writer. Although, it does complicate that because one of the lies he told is that he wrote all his books himself without any help from anybody. That is demonstrably not true. But he took a lot of heat in certain quarters, including in the Supreme Court itself, uh, for how much he wrote while the court was in session, when, you were, when technically you would think he'd have other things to do <laughs> than draft books. And East of Katahdin, the, re the reason for the title is that this is travel sketches, basically, of his. And it starts out, I believe this book starts out in Arizona. And he just moves closer and closer to Mount Katahdin in Maine. Uh, where I have spent many, many an hour, where I have spent many, much time adventuring, all through what is now Baxter State Park, but also on Katahdin itself, which is the tallest mountain in Maine, and which has a rather distinctive feature that you, if you're ever near Mount Katahdin and you're wondering if it's worth the day, if you're steady on your feet, there's a thing on Mount Katahdin called the Knife Edge. It's a particular geographical formation that can be walked, if you're careful, it's, it, as the title implies, it's a very thin walkway with sheer drops on either side. It goes on for a while. It doesn't go on for a, a whole long time, but it is an amazing experience to do. I have done that, and I'm, I'm, I, my, I, my extra claim to credit is that I have done that with a bunch of dogs. I didn't lose a single one of them. <laughs> I told my foreman, the particular time that I did this, I had a group of beagles, and one of those beagles was twice as old as the other beagles. He was still rock solid. He was he was my friend for a long, long time. He outlived his litter. And then, then he outlived the next litter. He lived for a long time. But he was still hale and healthy when we did Katahdin. And I got into the habit over the years of not so much ordering my boys around because they were everywhere. They were in every which direction. But rather just telling him what I wanted. And he would tell them what to do. <laughs> and we managed to get everybody across the knife's edge without losing anybody. They became, they, they, they disassembled into an unruly mob once we got to the other side. Uh, but this is going to be not just for Katahdin. This is going to be an enormous treat to reread. I haven't read it since I had that little mass market. Now I have the hardcover, uh, which 
will probably come in here. It will probably come in here. It's uh, one of the quests when I go to the Brattle on these OGBG war halls is to find books that, that will come in this room. Find books that will be keepers that will fill this bookcase right next to me uh, over the course of a year. Now, the the used book buying in 2021 has been a little bit more intense in January than I think it will be in other months, mainly thanks to the unceasing aggression of people like mild-mannered Bill Rutenberg or mild-mannered Peg at the History Shelf or mild-mannered church-going Todd Oval. I'm not going to call Mark Richardson mild-mannered. <laughs> if I weren't egged on by them, if they would simply agree to my territorial demands, then I would be as peaceful as a babe. <laughs> One way or another. This next one is also coming in here. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I almost have a full shelf of these books. This is by John Mitchell, and this is Who Wrote Shakespeare? Just as simple as that. Who wrote Shakespeare? Uh, assuming that Shakespeare did not. Uh, and I, I want to read you just a bit at the beginning here, because Mitchell gets right to the point. He dives right into the point. Some people do not approve of this subject. <laughs> They say that it denigrates Shakespeare and his legend, that it confuses the public and gives needless trouble to specialists in English literature. There is no doubt, they say, no doubt at all, that Mr. William Shakespeare wrote the plays and poems attributed to Shakespeare, and that Stratford-on-Avon is his proper shrine and reliquary. Uh, and he makes uh, a point of saying uh, how contested it is, how many different uh, warring groups for Bacon or for Marlowe or whatnot. And he makes an excellent point here. A good reason why the Stratfordians, those are the Stratford and Avon people, the people who say there is no argument here, there is no dissension, Shakespeare wrote the works attributed to him. Uh, the reason why the Stratfordians become agitated at the mention of the authorship question is that they, alone, of all the parties in the debate, have something to lose by it. The Shakespeare cult is established worldwide, with Stratford-upon-Avon at the hub of a vast industry, employing scholars, students, educationalists, authors, publishers, curators, tour guides, and trinket sellers, pleasantly and in large numbers. The Stratford birthplace, the prime asset of England's tourist trade, is now further aggrandized as a monument of Euro culture. Heretics who question the faith on which all this rests are not welcome, and must expect rough treatment at the hands of the Stratfordians. Yet, as a matter of visible fact, there is a problem. Lives and careers have been devoted to it, and it exists materially in an enormous body of literature on the question of Shakespeare's authorship. It would need a great library to accommodate the thousands of books, let alone countless pamphlets, journals, and articles which the debate has generated. The authorship problem does exist. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I think it's a dead, a, a drop-dead mistake, even to ask the question that forms the title of this book. And yet, Shakespearean authorship conspiracy theorists do it all the time. It's not enough for them to raise doubts. They have to ask, they have to supply a candidate. It's not, did Shakespeare write Shakespeare? That's not the title of this book. Instead, it's who wrote Shakespeare instead of Shakespeare. And that's a mugs game. That can't be won. Which is why there are, the title, the, the cover is just all of the candidates. And that's why it can't be won. That's why there are a thousand books on each candidate. Because there's no way to do that. There's no way, you can make a real convincing case for a whole bunch of people, but Shakespeare's name is a, is on the first folio. Shakespeare is, is called the author by Ben Jonson. Shakespeare can be identified and located in London in connection with the, with the dramatic companies that later put on some of his plays. So trying to substitute a candidate is going to be an uphill battle. When the real battle, the, the fairly easy battle, which everybody from Mark Twain to Sigmund Freud has pointed out, which is that it doesn't look on the surface like that Shakespeare, regardless of those connections, is the author. There's such an enormous discordance between the, the feel you get of that documentary Shakespeare and the feel you get of the person who wrote the plays when you read them that you can't help but think. I, I once had a student who knew nothing of the Shakespearean authorship controversy who put it rather succinctly to me when we were going over Shakespeare's what's known of his biography. The student looked at me and said, were there two of them? <laughs> there you go, I agree, that's a great question. <laughs> One way or another, uh, whether, it turns out, whether it turns out to be anything or not, I love these books, I have a whole bunch of them. Right there, on, right down there on the shelf, and this is going to go. I'm going to reread this, then it's going to go right on the shelf with all the other candidates. Uh, then we have something fascinating. Uh, a lot of you will know this author if you've worked in bookstores. This is Alan Eckert, and this is his book Wilderness Empire. He did a series of like ten books on the winning of the West. That's what he called it, and I think this is the second one. I think the Frontiersman was the first one. 
Uh, this is a hardcover of Alan Eckert. I'm, I idly looked uh, for this on uh, eBay. Again, sorry for the construction work, but the kids have to learn. If they're going to be at that three foot by six foot patch of concrete for the next 30 years, they're going to have to learn sometime. I'm hoping you can still hear me, even though the endless drone of construction work, the, the endless drone, that particular background noise here, let's sample it. That was going on at 11.15 last night. I had to uh, put on pants, put on a sweatshirt, put on a hat, put on a mask, go out, walk down the driveway, walk over to the guy overseeing the construction and say, if you don't knock off for the night right now, I'm going to call the police, I'm going to wait here, and I'm going to swear out a criminal complaint against every single one of you. You've been here for 11 hours. It's 11 at night. Knock off until 9 in the morning. And it was like I woke them out of a trance. It was like, oh, wow. They probably all had calls from their wives or their husbands all evening saying, where are you? Because there's something about this area, it's, I think, obviously, a gigantic leak of natural gas that will certainly account for my death. I think that's the reason that just puts people into a trance. Uh, here you hear sirens. And that's two different kinds of sirens. That's police and fire engine. That's on top of the construction noise. And if we wait long enough, you'll hear fighter jets going overhead at a very low altitude because they're coming in low at this point uh, in order to bomb the rebels just up the road. So I live in the most noisy place anywhere on Earth. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I was looking on eBay just idly at Alan, at Alan Eckert, wondering actually about the old mass market paperbacks that if any of you worked in bookstores 20 or 30 years ago, you might remember those paperbacks. There were a whole bunch of them. Uh, and I found that he's, these things are, are going for a lot of money. <laughs> so when I saw this at the battle for nothing, next to nothing, I grabbed it. Uh, this, the empire referred to in the title of this book is the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, which uh, Alan Eckhart researched to a fair thee well and, uh, and then wrote about. It was a vast uh, governing empire in land America that, that waged warfare against other Indian tribes, that co-opted and coerced other Indian tribes, and that eventually was... You know, as as Eckert puts it, it was a gleaming jewel, just waiting to tempt the French and the British. Uh, and this is, I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna be very, very enjoyable to reread this author. I haven't read him. The only thing I've read by him anyway recently is his great book on Tecumseh, his biography of Tecumseh, a, Sh a sorrow in our heart. And that book caused a lot of controversy uh, because the author engages in that book in a particular kind of biographical writing. Uh, it's not anything that anybody else does. He sort of perfected it himself in the modern era. Herodotus does it all the time. Livy does it all the time. But in the modern era, he sort of perfected an idea where uh, he fuses techniques of fiction into his history writing. He knows the records better than anybody. If he encounters in the records a, a doubly or triply attested conversation between two characters where the person who writes the record simply says what each character says, then in his book... He will make them say it. It'll be quotation marks. It'll be so-and-so said this. If he can in any way accurately infer the person's state of mind, he will give it. He will say it. So-and-so said such-and-such such in such-and-such such a state of mind. If he can infer their emotional state or if the eyewitness is to test their emotional state and he thinks it's trustworthy, he'll include it. It makes a fiction-style narrative out of what he's writing. And he does the same thing in this book. He does the same thing in all of these books in The Winning of the West. Uh, that same technique of fusing the uh, gestures of fiction with the historical record. And it vexed him. It caused him no end of nitpicking from, from critics, large and small, all the way from anonymous sniping at Kirkus, all the way to the New York Times, where people saying, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. That, that's not allowed as a historian. It drove him nuts, and I don't, I don't doubt that it did. I understand why it would drive him nuts, because it, it, you won't find a more scrupulous author. Uh, I, think, I think, actually, look at this. Isn't this lovely? That's what the whole thing looks like. That is just beautiful. Uh, I think he says that right at the beginning of pretty much every one of these books. Uh, let me see if we can find it. Yeah, the author's note, right at the beginning of this book. Wilderness Empire is fact. Not fiction. <laughs> it's as simple as it gets. And yet, there isn't a bookstore anywhere in the world that didn't shelve this in fiction. And all the paperbacks were shelved in fiction. Or in westerns. Worse. Uh, Wilderness Empire is fact, not fiction. 
Every incident herein described actually occurred. Every date is historically accurate. Every character, regardless of how major or how minor, actually lived in the role in which he is portrayed. And uh, this author is totally forgotten today, but trust me, you wouldn't have wanted to argue with him on that point. He knew his sources better than anybody. Uh, so it's going to be a treat uh, to, to read this again. And I'm wondering, naturally, since it's a Brattle Hall, I'm wondering if the person who dumped this at the Brattle Hall also dumped all the others. And in these editions, that would be wonderful. I'd love a bunch of these. Uh, and then we have uh, a nice, big, fat, collected short story edition that's definitely coming in this room. I may have to reinforce it. Pretty thing. From, I think, the 1980s. This is the, the collected stories of Sean, of, of Sean O'Fallon. And uh, the dust jacket, I think, refers to him as the gr Iron's greatest living storyteller. That This collected stories was uh, a fixture. When it, was, it, was it the 1980s? This was a fixture when it came out. Uh, it was... Uh, Uh, yeah, 1983. Uh, it was easy to sell this to customers. They, they just, you know, it was stacked everywhere and people wanted, you know, uh, the Irish are known for their short stories. They're known for their literary brilliance. And uh, as soon as I saw this at the Prattle, I realized that once upon a time, I had a Sean O'Fallon uh, paperback. I think from Penguin, maybe. But it wasn't this many. It wasn't this much at all. This is a, a massive thing that, excuse me, that I have not seen used ever until today. I remember it in bookstores, uh, but I grabbed it today when I saw it, uh, and it will go on the shelf here. I have a shelf in this room reserved for great short story collections. There's Eudora Welty, there's Flannery O'Connor, there's William Trevor, uh, there's John Cheever, and there's Frank O'Connor, and here, this, this will go on there, but not before a great deal of rereading. There are probably stories in here that I haven't read at all, which is just unacceptable. <laughs> and then the final book in this latest OGBG Hall War, Brattle Bookshop Hall, uh, is uh, a Norton anthology. Uh, some of you may have seen on uh, Mark Richardson's channel, for instance, not that you should watch his channel, He's almost at 2,000 subscribers. Let's get him over 2,000. Uh, but uh, he has championed on his channel, and I wholeheartedly agree with it, that sometimes literary anthologies that are put together for school can make really great volumes to have, whether you're going to school or not. If you're lucky enough to find one that's in good shape and that isn't underlined or highlighted all to hell and gone by some student, uh, and I found one of those today, the Norton Anthology of Poetry, in a very nice, thinner hardcover. This hardcover is thinner and taller, uh, and it took some reinforcing. It was in really bad shape when I found it. Uh, but it is from the 1970s, the late 1970s. So it's safe. And this has everybody in English, uh, from Chaucer all the way to the present day. Randall Jarrell, I think, is in here. Uh, and it's, it's safe because Norton Anthology of Poetry that's put out today is totally useless as a poetry anthology. It doesn't care about poetry. It only cares about politics. So the editors of the Norton Anthology of Poetry today are, they spend all of their time researching the sexuality, the sexual operation history, the country of origin, the 93andMe genetic components of the writers and including them uh, accordingly. And it, it, if that means that you have X number of pages for great restoration poetry and you have a choice between uh, a half Portuguese water wa washerwoman who occasionally wrote ditties and who extensive archaeological research was able to unearth or John Dryden well you include her you might in the introductory note to that section you might mention that the foremost poetry uh, poet of the age was John Dryden but you won't include him you'll include her for progressive stack reasons, for political reasons. And the Norton Anthology, the Columbia Anthology, all the current anthologies do that. They are all therefore completely worthless uh, because they are intentionally showing, giving to their readers second and third rate stuff. They know who wrote the first rate stuff and they don't care. And that is not what an anthology should do. <laughs> Obviously, that is not what an anthology should do. And this one doesn't. I remember, uh, I think I've used this a couple of times in classes. I was very happy to find it and to find it in, per, in you know, untouched shape. The, the dust jacket 
was worn away to hell and gone, probably because this was a hand-me-down. Probably many students used this, but I'm glad to have it. And uh, like Mark, Mark has mentioned, I will just browse through here and enjoy seeing all this stuff juxtaposed with each other. That'll be a lot of fun. So there you have it. That was my wartime Brattle Hall, my latest one. This was a Wednesday Brattle Hall. Uh, so we have the Norton Anthology of Poetry. Uh, just as simple as that. The Norton Anthology of Poetry. Then we have the Collected Stories of Sean O'Flallon. Uh, we have uh, Wilderness Empire by Alan Eckert. Uh, we have Who Wrote Shakespeare? Well, who did? You tell me. <laughs> we have uh, East to Katahdin by Justice Douglas. Uh, we have For Love and Money by Jonathan Raven. Uh, let's see here. We have Essays on Literature and Politics, 1932 to 1972, a book badly in need of a title uh, by a great critic gone too soon. We have Everybody's Peeps. Just I, I just revived and saved a version of Everybody's Peeps because I couldn't stand to see it just go nowhere. And finally, Dr. Zhivago in the Pantheon hardcover. Uh, so that was my Brattle Hall, the second of this week. <laughs> His bookcase is not full yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.